Christ Chapel. We are so glad you're with us today. I'm Reverend Gerald Walls, the pastor here, and we are just so thankful that you've joined us and pray for God's blessings upon you as we start our service today. And first of all, I do want to just thank those who keep us going whenever I'm away. John and I had a, a nice uh, little vacation. Uh, started out going to Wellington, Nevada, one of those spots that if you blink, you miss it. And we, uh, I officiated the marriage of Frank and Chuck. And Frank attended our church for many years before they, he moved. And uh, then he met Chuck and they um, had their wedding in their lovely backyard, or actually side yard. It was beautifully decorated, beautifully done. And he said the only thing he misses about L.A. is Christ Chapel. <laughs> he just wishes we had a church there. Uh, but he sends his love and his greetings and just so, uh, so glad to be a part of it. And then after the ceremony, John and I got to visit with Kathy Baldock. I had dinner with her and then just spent a few days uh, traveling from there to down the coast. So it was a great getaway. I just want to thank everyone for keeping things going here, for Dwayne for speaking last week. And um, also, we had someone lined up for Wednesday night who had a family emergency, and Christine jumped in last minute and pulled something together for us so that we had Bible study. So again, I'm just so grateful for our amazing church, our wonderful church that just keeps things going, and just for your faithfulness and all your hard work. And um, we'll go, Lord, in prayer, but just a reminder that we are taking prayer requests. So if you're online, be sure and put those in the comment section, and those will be texted over to me at the end of the service. For those of you here, we'll ask for those at the end of the service. But let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we are grateful. We're grateful for a time that we can get together to worship and praise you. And God, just to receive what you have for us today. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. Minister to each heart and each life and prepare us, O oh God. And Lord, just help us to be able to sense your spirit working within us. And God, we just ask your continued blessings on everything that's said and done today. In Jesus' name, amen. So speaking of wonderful and amazing, we are going to turn the service over to our music team. So if you'll rise and sing and stand and sing as they lead us in song. my father, I see the love in his eyes, and everything that my heart knows, and I'm his joy and his pride. I feel his face in the whisper, and his intentions are pure, and never have I felt more safe than secure. He said that you would never be. I know that you are here with me. You said that you would never leave. And I know that you are here with me. Oh, it was late in the midnight when you gave me a song. And then the sun came rising. I sing all day long. Now I'm a testimony. Said I'm a living proof that what He did for me, He will do it for you. Oh, you said that you would never leave, and I know that you are here with. You said that you would never leave. I know that you are here with me. Whether I come or go, in heaven or hell below, you ain't going anywhere. You ain't going anywhere. Seasons come and seasons go. But one thing I know for sure, you ain't going anywhere. You 
ain't going anywhere Whether I come or go In heaven or hell below You ain't going anywhere You ain't going anywhere Seasons come and seasons go But one thing I know for sure You ain't going anywhere You ain't going anywhere you would never leave I know that you are here with me You said that you would never leave I know that you are here with me That you were here with me. I know it, I know it, I know it. You said that you would never leave. I know that you were here with me. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. And your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And my heart is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. And my battle and I know 
are so amazing and do such a good job for us to help us as we uh, as we t take time to sing our praises and adoration to God. And I know that as uh, Dwayne did a great job last week, so thankful that he's available for us and will help us out from time to time. And it, um, but it was a time to get away. And often when I'm away, it gives me time to just not have to worry about the everyday things of the church or the ministry and those type of things and usually there's ideas that come quickly to me but this week is like God the weekend's coming where are we going what do you want me to talk about and the Lord just reminded me about those who have stepped up things that have happened and like even Frank and his faithfulness to Christ Chapel even though he's not been a part of our able to attend for years and I thought about Kathy Baldock who has been faithful in her ministry with all the things that have come against her as she gets the message out there that what scripture really says about LGBTQ and how God loves us and accepts us as we are. And she doesn't have to. She's straight. And as far as she knows, there's no one in her family who's LGBTQ that this would apply to. And yet she will handle that and keep being faithful. Couldn't help but think about our church family, how faithful you have been to just during this pandemic and some of you have been around for years to support and encourage us and help us over the years and I thought it's so great to see the faithfulness of God's people and then I also was even more grateful for your faithfulness and the continued faithfulness is each week it seems like I'm getting notices about someone who it's either well known in the evangelical or Christian community or maybe a child of someone in the community who have denounced their Christianity. They've lost their faith. Some of those have just lost the religiosity of Christianity and that part I understand. We, there's part of the religiosity part I think we could do away with. But I know some of these people, and I know ones in our own uh, connections of our church for the past 30 years have, I know they've had a relationship with God. I know God has ministered to them, and somehow, because of doubts and fears and uncertainties, I see them stepping away 
We do live in a time of questioning, and it's fine to question. We should be questioning some of the things that have, we have always been told because that's what got some of us to understand that we can be accepted as we were created to be in the presence of God by having those questions. And I think it's fine to dissect that which is biblical to that which is just theology that has crept into the church because as I've read different passages and things in Scripture, I'll be like, that's where they get that idea. It's one line and one verse, and all of a sudden they built this whole doctrine around it that separates people from God rather than drawing people to God. So as we see those things, we understand it's good to question, but how do we hold on to our faith? How do we remain faithful? And we know this is just a part of Scripture being fulfilled. Scripture does tell us in the last days there will be a great falling away. Those who used to follow Christ won't be following him anymore. And it's scary, and it breaks my heart when I hear people who have stopped with their faith or walked away from their faith. And I know it's part of what Scripture has said. And again, we know we start talking about the last days and that we start getting freaked out, especially those of us who grew up in, as Christians in the 80s where Every sermon was about Jesus is coming back. You better get down to this altar and repent and cry your eyes out because Jesus could come back and you're going to be left. And that, that fear, and that's not what I'm talking about when we think about the return of Christ. We, we need to be aware of what is our relationship. Are we remaining faithful when others don't? Yes, Scripture talks about the return of Christ, and I believe it will happen. I just don't know when or how. As we were driving up on the east side of California and the mountains and the winds from the wildfires was blowing the smoke and ash across the, the plains all the way through, all the way up to, to Nevada. And there were times it was the sun was dark and the moon looked like blood. And when I would see that, I was reminded of passages of Joel and Acts and Revelations that says, in the last days, that's what's going to happen. And then I thought about, oh, we're in climate change and this climate warming, and it may not be happening all over the earth because there will be a time when only a third of the earth will survive. But I'm thinking, this shows the possibility of Scripture being fulfilled. Things are heating up. There is a prediction of fire, and it starts making us think, oh, my goodness, we could start being near the birth pains of the coming of the Lord. Again, I don't want us to live in fear and thinking, oh, we better go weep, wail, and mourn before the altar. I want us to be encouraged, rather, that we become Christ in this world. Christians mean little Christ. Are we being Christ to a world that definitely needs to know it? Are we being the truth of Christ and not just some theological idea? Do we have that faithfulness in our heart to know what we really know and believe? Yes, we know Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour when Christ will return. So if anyone does give you a day or an hour or a time, pretty much write them off because they did that all through the 70s and 80s and we're all still here. So don't have to give them credit. But it's the thing of are we paying attention to the warning signs? Not out of fear, but out of the excitement to know that that glorious day of the Lord could come. And are we remaining faithful? That's the main part. Are we remaining faithful? Steve Green had a song, it was at least 10 years ago, and it was, may those who have gone before us find us faithful. And that's my call to us today, that we just continue being faithful when we have those things in life that can make us think, why am I following this? Do I really believe this? Do I accept this? Will we remain faithful? So there's a passage in Matthew. It's Matthew 13, 3 through 9, and it's one where Jesus talks about this type of thing. He says, <clears throat> excuse me, that then he, Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, as we know, if we read on down in the passage, that the disciples didn't get it. 
They didn't understand this parable, didn't know what it means. And I don't think we would actually get the full idea either if Jesus didn't explain it to us. But as we look at each of these types of soil, it lets us know, are we examining our own heart? How are we doing with our doubts and our fears? How are we doing with these things that that may creep in and try to chip away at our faith? And are we doing what we can to remain faithful? Our goal is that whenever we leave this world or when Christ comes back, whichever comes first, and we stand before God, that we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's why we want to remain faithful. Ever get tired of doing the right thing? Wouldn't it be easier just to go with the crowd and not have to stand up for, why do you believe what that stuff? Why do you understand that? Why do you accept it? It makes us have to think and realize, do I know what's going on in the kingdom of God? Am I being faithful to what God has called us to do? And in this parable, Jesus explains that if we know that the seed, and this to us, and we know the seed represents the kingdom of God, we boil that down to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does this message of the gospel and we know the gospel often is reflected as just being the death and resurrection of Christ but the gospel actually includes everything from Genesis to Revelation it's the all understanding of who God is and so that's the seed that's being sown out here and what's interesting it's not the farmer that we're looking at it's not the one sowing the seed because the farmer would represent God. Others have seen it as in evangelical circles often refer it to those of us who spread the gospel or preach about Christ. And, but we see that in our day and time, also we know that in farming, things are different. We have new technology, new equipment. Things are completely different than before. But we still know the philosophy is still the same. You sow seed, you don't know exactly how much return you'll get on that, but you just do what God has called you to do. And that's all we're asked to do. What has God called you to do? Are you producing the type of seed you need to? So what's the first soil? That first soil are those whose perception is off. They don't quite have a true perception of the things of God, and not perception in life, but of spiritual things. Many people have a form of spirituality, but they don't quite understand this gospel message of Christ, and so it's easy for it to be trampled on. It's easy for any time the message is presented for them to walk away. So whenever they hear the message, they don't have much to filter it through of an understanding of who God is because their soil has not been prepared, and so it gets robbed from them. I think this can apply to followers of Jesus who have heard parts of the gospel that they just accept and think that, well, if I'm going to get rich, then I'll follow Christ. But if I'm not going to get rich, why follow Christ? You know, they start having this idea that maybe what the things they've heard is like, well, you'll never get sick if you're a Christian. You'll never have bad things happen if you're a Christian. And they want to grab onto that, but then they find out, well, that's not always the truth. That doesn't always happen, so they walk away. And yet we know the basics of the gospel is so simple that a child can get it. So when it talks about the seeds planted on the, on, are sown on the road and it's trampled upon or is take, quickly snatched away, we're like, well, why would it be? It's such simple to understand, but it means their eyes haven't been open to the things of God. And we understand some of that, of why whenever they hear the gospel and the message of Christ, that they're thinking, I don't know about this soil. I don't understand what it's about. I don't know that I want it to take root because I just don't get it. Because if we think about it, is it really logical that Jesus rose from the dead? The only thing we have experience with anyone rising from the dead are TV shows where it's the walking dead. But here's someone who came to life with power and authority and just appearance of being healthy and strong again. It doesn't make logical sense to us. How is it that Jesus isn't walking the earth with us today if he rose from the grave and never to die again? What's this whole ascension thing? What does that mean? Is, is there, you know, beam me up, Scotty? What happened? It's not logical. But yet, when we have the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, as we read these things, we start coming to the faithfulness of God, of knowing that with God, all things are possible. However God wants to make it happen, it will happen. It's that faithfulness to believe that, that God will fulfill what he has said. And it takes the Holy Spirit for us to understand these truths. 
So we can get it that there's some that is going to be in the, on the path. It's not going to be, the soil's not going to be prepared for it. But then as we open up our hearts, God prepares it for us. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 tells us, Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is the Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So the lack of understanding that person was just that they've not allowed the Holy Spirit to help cultivate their hearts and minds to understand. These are ones that, they're, that the evil one is so quick to steal that which is planted. That's why we need to have prayer for our friends, our loved ones who may not understand. Because, of course, the evil one's desire is to destroy the work of God in someone's life. And when we start thinking about the evil one, we start thinking about this Satan person that we've heard about. And we know there exists. But yet in our mind, we see the horns, we see the pitchfork, we see he's red. We saw the, the music video not long ago of someone giving Satan a lap dance. Those type of things. And so we put this image that that is what Satan is. When it's the evil, the spirit of evil in the world, and yes, I believe it is a being. But again, we put him in this red suit, so we miss out whenever the enemy does try to come in and snatch away those things that are of God. We're told he can be an angel of light. It looks like it's good. It looks like it's the things that you would want to appeal to or drawn to. And that's why he can distract people from the truth of the gospel and why that faith can be snatched away even from those who grew up in church, those who have been around it. So as we read more and more about those who are well-known, and some of these well-known, their kids, uh, Tony and Peggy Campolo's son, we've got uh, the Francis Schaeffer's son, Piper's son, all these ones who grew up in these strong homes having doubts, they got it snatched away because they weren't allowing it to take root. That's why we need to be sure we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. If we're going to remain faithful, we've got to grasp these things and hold on to it and not let it be stolen away. The next group was the precarious faith. Those who were joyous when they find this relationship with God as something new and exciting for them. And the church falls into this often that we are so excited about that. When someone finds Christ, they are so elated and they're so ready and gung-ho. The problem is that we tend to put them on display. I've seen that famous people will come to know Christ and all of a sudden these churches will put them on the platform because they draw a crowd. Preachers love crowds. So it draws a crowd and, and they get this person up there and then the person starts having doubts and uncertainties and then it causes doubts and uncertainties to those since they've been elevated too soon. That is a warning to churches to not be too quick when people get involved. you got those who come in and they want to sign up for every den. I've actually had people who walked in the door for the first time and as they leave they ask, how do you get on the board here? It's like, I don't think you know how we work. I think you need to know us first. And it'll usually tell people, get to know us. Make sure we are the fit and we'll be glad to have you work. Because we get excited for it. We need workers. We need those who are willing to serve and to do. But again, we need to be careful that their root system is established. Because it may grow first. And we see a lot of Christian people who dive in gung-ho. But will they remain faithful? When the trials come, when the difficulties come, they walk away. And as contrary to what some will be told from the pulpit, troubles will come. It is a part of life. And if you expect that following Christ will mean nothing will go wrong in your life, then you're probably going to be sorely disappointed. But thankfully, we also have the saying, it's not scriptural, but it's, it's a great saying that this too will pass. We know that whatever it may be, it will pass. But it's through the trials and through the troubles that if it doesn't snatch away your faith, it will make your faith grow stronger. You will be able to stand firm in the things that come your way. And we need that stick to That no matter what others do, no matter what others say, no matter where our friends may go or what they may think, that we are going to remain faithful. And again, the problem wasn't the seed that was sown. The gospel message is simple. But it was the soil. Are we prepared? And how do we prepare our soil? How do we prepare it so that it's not shallow, that it grows deep? Well, we study the Bible. We keep time in prayer. We have communion with other believers. We serve. 
And I know those are typical things. It's like we should know those things, but how often are we spending? How much time do we spend in prayer, in the word? How much time are we surrounding ourselves with believers? How much time do we spend in serving other people? That was the ministry of Christ. We're in a Christianity era of where it's about me, me, me. What do I get out of it? How do I get blessed? How do I get all God wants for me? When we look at what Jesus did was how do I give? How do I serve? How do I help other people? Such an opposite way of thinking. And Tim Paul gives us a warning in 1 Timothy 5.22. He just says, don't be hasty in laying on of hands. Again, just to remind us, don't, don't get too excited too soon. Be sure you know where you're at. Let your roots take hold and then start moving out in the kingdom of God. Because we often hear those who blame the church or other people whenever things go wrong in their life. They're not going to build their faith. That one is depending on others' root systems. And I think that's what happens with a lot of the young people who are no longer in the faith, is that they were depending on their parents' faith. But then when trials and persecutions and difficulties come, they left. So Paul gave us this encouragement in Galatians 5, 7. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? So again, it, are we pursuing with our faithfulness? Are we allowing God to work in our life? Not that doubts are wrong. Doubts happen. But what are we doing with our doubts? Do we allow them to take us away from God? Do we start listening to other things that may take us also, draw us away from our walk with God? Or are we using those doubts to seek God and say, God, I need to get rooted in this. I need an understanding in this. Help me to learn and to grow. That takes a lot of work. And sometimes you won't get the answer. There are some things in scripture that I read and I'm like, God, I don't understand it. But I get a piece of my heart and mind that God is in control and God has a bigger brain than I have. God can figure it out. I don't have to figure out everything. But it gets my faith in the right place where it needs to be. The third, of course, is one that many people deal with, that priorities are out of order. It's so easy to follow the cares and the concerns of our world. And these are people I know who, that I do know, who seem to just be able to take life as it comes. They don't mind living hand to mouth. They're good with what they have. They're okay with just things day by day, and they live comfortably with that. But a lot of us are more concerned about what does the future look like? How are we going to survive this pandemic? What do we happen? I'm at the age now. Will I be able to ever retire? Are there things that's going to be taken care of? Are they, and they start being these priorities of life that aren't bad. It's just these things can get in the way because now instead of being faithful to the things of God, we got to make sure this is taken care of. The next egg is built. That everything is set exactly what we want. And I've heard people say, once I get all that together, then I'll serve Jesus. God's saying, do it at together. Do it at the same time. Allow God to work in your life. And Jesus describes this one as one who hears and receives the word, but other things get in the way. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean they're not believers. It just means they're allowing things to the cares of this world to interrupt their spiritual development. And if we don't continually to grow in our spiritual walk, we won't remain faithful. There will be those things that will draw us away. There are the things that can still and the care or the cares of the world that can choke out the word of God. The bird stole from the first one. The second one shows trampling on our faith. And here we just see it gets choked out. We were running a good race. Everything was good. We were following God, but we allowed these things of life to get in the way. Jesus gives an example in Luke 14, 16 through 21. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent the servants to tell them who had been invited Come, for everything is now ready. And they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. And it again just shows us that even then there were the same excuses we have. Don't we have the excuses? 
something new has come into our life. We don't have time for anything else. We maybe got a new job, and so now we got to uh, figure out how to make that happen rather than allowing the things of God in our life. And, of course, then we know those who often find that new relationship on Saturday night, that this is the one. It may last for a couple of weeks for them, but for some reason, they step away from their walk with Christ. These things are the same. And there's nothing wrong with wanting these things in our life. There's nothing wrong with having property. There's nothing wrong with the, the new um, uh, job. There's nothing wrong with a new relationship or a committed relationship. Those are all things, but are we keeping our priorities in order where in spite of all those things, God is still overall? Now, I know I used this scripture not long ago, but it's a great reminder to us. I know I have to read it periodically just to help me because I can get nervous and anxious about what the future may hold. But Matthew 6, 25 through 34 says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's an easy verse to quote. It's a great verse to remember, but sometimes difficult to put in practice. But it reminds us, are we having our priorities in order? That's what helps us remain faithful. Are we allowing the things of God to be first? Now, Oswald Chambers, he gets pretty tough. He says, it is not only wrong to worry, but it's disbelief. When we allow the anxiousness and the thoughts and the worries, then all of a sudden it's a sign of disbelief that God will take care of us. So we need to work on our faithfulness and our, our sense that God will come through. That we not be so focused on all these other things that it takes us away from our walk with God. We can be weighed down with the cares of the world, but most importantly, are we seeking God first? Which leads to the last soil, the prepared soil. That which is ready to allow God to work in their lives. Now, I know these are the easiest people for a minister to minister to because they're prepared. They're ready for what God wants. They have already gone through some of the tough times. They have strengthened their faith. They're rooted. They're grounded. They know what things are. And, and thankfully, we have those, most of our churches like that, of where we are rooted and grounded. And we know the faith of which Christ has given to our life. And so we can hold on to those things. The soil wasn't good on its own. It was prepared. How do we prepare the soil? Through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to work within your heart and life? To help you receive all that God has for you? Are you tending the soil? I know I mentioned these things before, but they're the simple things. Are you staying in the Word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you fellowshipping with other believers? Are you serving? Are you worshiping? Are you expressing thanks for what Christ has done? Those are things that help us to stay rooted. And this preparation can uh, apply even to our service times. And I don't want to give, uh, get anyone off the hook of those of us who help prepare the services. We've got to be prepared as well. We have to come with what we sense God has put within our heart. But how about you? Are you preparing yourself when you walk into the building? Are you expecting then the music team to draw you into that particular place? Uh, I wasn't moved by music today. Well, were you in a place to be moved? Uh, the sermon didn't mean anything to me. I, it's, you know, God didn't speak to me. I, well, were you prepared to hear? I've heard some pretty bad sermons in my life. 
I've been in church since I was 10 days old. There are some awful ones, and some of them have been my own. <laughs> but usually, I walk out with a little tidbit of information, maybe an edification, a new insight, or a new understanding. Those are the things that we start preparing ourselves to say, God, I don't know where this guy's going. I don't know what he's saying, but I can hold on to that truth. I don't believe what he said about this, but I can hold on to that truth. And that's where we start just continuing to build our faithfulness in the things of God. So we have to do our own soil testing. Are we prepared? Are we preparing our heart for the things of God? Now, to have good soil doesn't mean there won't be a time when a rock gets in the way. That there won't be a rock in our soil. And we may stumble a little bit, but thankfully we won't fall if we're allowing God to work in our heart. There may be a thorn bush that starts to grow up in our life, but through the power of the Holy Spirit and work of us continuing being faithful, we can uproot it. We may find our priorities are out of order, and we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart and tell us, you know, this is fine and good that you're doing these things, but be sure you include me. Just these things that help us know God is working. And I like that Jesus pointed out that the end result wasn't one figure for everybody. It wasn't that you're going to reap 100% on everything. Sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 60, sometimes 100. That's just examples. And I know growing up evangelicals, many of us heard that as the number of notches we'd have in our Bible of how many people we bring to Jesus. You're going to have a 30%, a 60%, 100%. But what I see more is this is talking about us being rooted and us being growing in the kingdom of God. Are we reflecting Christ in our life? Is our faithfulness to Christ being revealed through us? Are you seeing God at work in your life? And I like it too because it means we're not all to reap at the same rate. That's why we can come together as a church family and not look down at somebody else who may not be a 60-person reaper. They might only be 20, 25, 30. But are you seeing growth in their life? That's what matters. And you in their life helps them to grow. So it's that point of us working together, not looking down at one another, not thinking, well, someone else isn't doing enough or they should be further along. Allow the Holy Spirit to determine in their life where they are in their walk. As they remain faithful, they will see more growth in their life as well. We just remain faithful to what God has called us. And are we being faithful to those things God has called us to? To be part of the good soil means that we don't just receive, but we have to give. That as the soil reaps, it produces a crop that then goes out to the world. Are we reflecting Christ to our world? Are we doing the things that are needed? These four types of soil describe individuals. And as we are in a time when so many people are walking away from their faith, the goal is for us to remain faithful. So we may need to do some soil testing and see where we stand. Because I know when I hear about these people of faith who are walking away, it, my heart sinks. I ache. And I think, God, where have we gone wrong? What do we need to do different? And often God will speak, you need to take care of yourself. You need to make sure you're being faithful. In fact, in my daily prayer time, I use an app just because I also have all of you listed who are members so I can remember, make sure I pray for everybody once a month at least. And so I'll go through the app, and one of the things that comes up is the fruit of the Spirit. And each day a different fruit of the Spirit comes up, and faithfulness comes up often. And I just pray, God, help me to remain faithful to what you called me to do. These are things that help us to grow and to develop in our walk with Christ. And sometimes we just need the encouragement to keep moving forward. So Hebrews does that in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the author the founder and perfecter of our faith. That's what will help us remain faithful, keeping our eyes on Christ. So as we look at this, these different soils, as we examine our own hearts, where are we at? Is our perception right? Are we in true understanding of what the gospel is, or are we just taking 
spiritual truths from wherever we may grab them and not from the word of God? Are we a little precarious of where we may be gung-ho for a while, but then we burn out quickly? Do we have our priorities in order? Or are we prepared for what God has for us? So as we go to a time of prayer, I just want you to examine your own heart and say, God, how can I remain faithful? What do I need to do different to keep faithful in a time when so many people are falling away? Because we want to be faithful till Christ returns. Let's pray. God, I just ask that you minister to our hearts. And God, work in our hearts. Those areas where our faithfulness may be wavering, our doubts may be stronger than our faith at times. So God, we call upon the Holy Spirit to come upon us and minister to us. We know, God, that that which was on the pathway that got snatched away quickly, that it just meant the ground was too hard to accept the truth. And Lord, I just ask that you help us to, as we deal with those in our world who are hard to the things of you that are just not interested, God, allow the Holy Spirit to help break up that soil, to allow it to take root. For those that are shallow in their walk with God, Lord, we just ask that you allow the things that get in the way, the things that they grow up quickly, but then they don't last, that you allow us, oh God, to be there to support, to encourage, to help others walk in their faith. And God, if we're in that place where we're gung-ho for a while, then we back away, gung-ho, then back away. Lord, help us to remember this passage in Hebrews, just to keep our eye on you. And Lord, if there's those things of life that just are getting in our way, that we don't have our priorities in order, allow us to hear you speak to us. Allow us to hear what needs to be done in the right order and how that needs to happen. And God, I just ask that you stir up those who are faithful, that you help us to be continue to be faithful to walking in your path, to be who you need us to be, to reflect Jesus to our world that we can help others see who you are and not some of the things that are distracting from the cause of Christ. Lord, we ask your blessings on this congregation. Help us as we uh, thank you for those who have remained faithful, continue to be faithful, but God, continue to help us to remain faithful as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll take prayer requests at this time. There's no online prayer request, so how about here? Yeah, Bobby? Wow, okay. That was your dad and a cousin. go to God in prayer. (laughs) God, we thank you for your faithfulness, that you are faithful to us even when we're not at times. And God, we're so grateful that we can come before you with our requests and our needs as we've offered our praise and adoration and our thanks. And Lord, we just want to remain faithful in you. And God, I just pray that you minister to each of these needs that have been presented, oh God. We pray for Bobby's dad, that you give his body strength and help as he recovers from this heart attack, oh Lord. That, uh, that you be there with him, that you're, the family will surround him. And we ask that you also minister to Bobby, who's not able to be by his dad's side. That you just give him peace and comfort of heart and mind. And for his cousin as well, that has the feeding tube and all that's going on with him, Lord. We just ask that you... <coughs> Minister to him and and guide him, O God. Just let your Holy Spirit work within his life, their life. And God, we ask that you minister in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for uh, Candace's uh, sister who's lost her husband, we, Lord, we know how 
painful grief is and how difficult the process is and God that no matter what people say that it's only you who can bring that comfort so God we ask that you bring a comfort that seems impossible a comfort that can just allow a sense of of hope in the midst of despair and that you be with that family as they process things and Lord for her the friends her friends with COVID and God I know uh, Several of us know people who have been affected with the COVID or infected either way. And Lord, we ask that you minister healing and help. And God, we pray uh, against this disease, oh God. We pray that you help us to get beyond it so that we can go about a semi-normal way of life. God, we just ask for your power and work and your Holy Spirit to minister in each one. God, we bring Kelly before you in the name of Jesus. We ask for healing in her body. We ask for wholeness. We pray for Holly, oh God, that you give her that, that, uh, that strength that she needs, that comfort that she needs, oh God, the strength that she needs during this time. And God, we just pray for Kelly's body that it be able to respond properly to the treatments and to all that that's happening, oh God. We ask for complete healing and wholeness. And Lord, we just ask for peace on this family, God, that you give them that assurance that you are walking with them through this dark shadow and lord we ask that you minister to them as they they process through oh god let your holy spirit just minister to their hearts and to their lives and god for By brian By byron lord we pray for him oh lord that you minister god that you help him with his mental health situation lord that you help him find the the help that he needs the support that he needs and and god the meta the medical care that he needs oh lord just be with him, O oh Lord, as he struggles, and, and God, just, uh, it, just knowing that the, the difficulty he must be feeling in his own self. And God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will bring healing and wholeness and touch to his body in the name of Jesus. God, you know those other needs in our heart that we didn't feel comfortable making public. But God, each of us, I'm sure, have something in our life we wish wasn't there. So God, we call on you for that help and that strength and to guide us and direct us. And, and God, our desire is to have it removed out of the way completely. But God, we know sometimes you make us walk through these difficult times to help us to test our faith, to see if our faith will grow or if we're going to uproot and walk away. God, allow our faith to be strong and help us to believe in you that despite what may come our way, good, bad, or indifferent, Lord, that you are there to be with us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, and help us along the way. And we thank you for bringing a church family along us, beside us to also help us in the call that you've called us to do. And we thank you, God, for all you're doing in our midst and in our life. In Jesus' His name, Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we do have another uh, person that's been faithful that we want to acknowledge today. Uh, David Witt has been our lead usher for many years. Uh, he and Phil are moving. They're, uh, he'll be around for hoping for a few more weeks, uh, but they're going to be moving. But we wanted to honor him today and thank him for all of his hard work. So David, would you mind coming forward? Got a token of our appreciation. David has been an usher at least 20 years, if not longer. He's been around forever. He's been our lead usher for many, many years. So we wanted to get him a plaque and just, oh. oops, is it backwards? No, it's right. Sure. It's backwards to me, not to you. <laughs> but we want to give you a plaque. Well, there's also a card that's being signed, that's being passed around. We'll get that to you as well. And uh, we saw good, some great pictures of you. I love the one of the festival where you... <laughs> <laughs> so some great pictures and also just a gift card of appreciation. Thank so thank we you thank you much. and love you. And uh, let's pray for David as he as Phil will take on a new era of life. God, we thank you for this example of faithfulness, one who has just been so dedicated to you and uh, follows through on everything. And Lord, we are just so grateful for his years of service and, and help and support of our congregation. And God, as he and Phil take this new venture of life and as they go into this new era, uh, this new city, Lord, that you go before them, prepare the way, and God, just uh, continue to minister your grace and love and kindness to them, O oh God, and your blessings in their life. We send him out with our blessings and our love, and Lord, we, he'll never not be a part of our family. So God, we ask that you bless him and keep him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank love you, you so much.
we're not being left in a lurch. Sherry Randall will be taking the role of lead usher for us, so she'll be starting next week. So thank you, Sherry, for that, and um, just thank you for the blessings. So we do have a few announcements. We do have Bible study on Wednesday night at 7.30. It can be, we'll be here in the fellowship area. Uh, if those who would like to attend, uh, if you're still more comfortable at home, we do have the Zoom as well. Um, we're starting a new series this week, so, uh, and my mind is gone from this being on vacation. I can't remember the title of it, and Derek's not here to remind me. But anyway, we're starting this on Wednesday. Uh, there'll be a new series. Uh, you can join us at any time. We invite you to be a part of that. And then also, we are continuing our building fund. So God's home improvement. Uh, just some things we need to get together. The places coming together well. But there's just some things that we're going to have to do uh, with the city and things that are they're going to be costly. So we just need you to, to keep that in prayer as we move forward with where God leads us. And, of course, not just the building fund, but our everyday operational needs are also important. So we ask that you just continue to support. Those of you at home, there's ways to do it through PayPal. Well, here through PayPal, you can do auto pay or uh, mail in a check. Uh, but also, we've got a donation box in the back if, for those who would like to support us now. So let's pray over our offering. God, we ask your blessings on our congregation, upon our church. Lord, we pray a blessing upon the offerings as we present a token back to you of what you've given to us. And God, we're just so grateful for the faithfulness of those who continue to support and continue to help us to do this ministry to our community and to reach out in various ways and opportunities that are out there. And God, I just pray that you continue to bless the board as they make the decisions over the offering, that you bless the congregation as they give, that you have promised to, to return unto them that which they've given. And Lord, we ask that you continue to stretch every dollar in their life. And Lord, as we are looking at things slowly opening up and some of the opportunities that are opening for um, me to be present at, uh, that you allow us to be able to continue to do these things. And God, we just ask your blessing on our church, upon this congregation, in Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, we'll turn it back to our wonderful music team as they come and lead us out in song. Please stand and sing along with us. Oh, 
Continue in your life and your work and go out and be Jesus in our world. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.